Welcome to the Truth Over Comfort Show. Today's guest is Stuart J. Hooper, a lecturer and PhD researcher in the military, industrial complex, elites, war, and globalism. Today's topics are going to be about the military, industrial complex, how it came out of the ashes of World War II in the United States, and how it's progressed over the years, becoming more privatized, transnational, and even intertwining in the modern state with tech companies. Good to have you here, Stuart. Yeah, great to be here, Lou. And uh, yeah, we applaud your efforts to do this channel and, and try to get this thing off the ground and hopefully uh, can give your viewers some useful information. <clears throat> Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself and the academic lens you're looking at these topics through. Yeah, so I come from a, a small town in Essex, England, and uh, grew up through the era of the war on terror. I remember coming home from school, was 10 years old, and the TV was on, and there was lots of dramatic stuff going on on the TV. And I was just old enough to realize that probably something big was happening. <laughs> and this was probably a significant event that you don't see all the time. Um, this is um, a point where... Um, I think the seed was planted in my brain to start paying attention to world affairs and what goes on in the world and international political um, situations. So then I go through school and I've always kind of got at least a, a slight glance on the war on terror and everything that's going on there. And I'm keeping my ears open a little, again, as much as you can do when you're younger. Um, and I start to hear complaints about what's going on. Why are we really in Iraq? Why are we really in Afghanistan? Who actually is benefiting from these conflicts? Is it actually the Afghan people? Is it the Iraqi people? Or are there some ulterior motives here, perhaps? And the big one that I remember hearing almost immediately about Iraq was, of course, the oil, um, uh, let's say, perhaps motive <laughs> um, that came from the Iraq war. And yeah, that was kind of just the the seed in my mind that had always been there. <clears throat> then fast forward a few more years, 2007, 2008, financial crisis comes around. <clears throat> Global economy collapses um, around us. Um, and ultimately that becomes the big political topic, it kind of replaces the war on terror. And that's when I really started to uh, pay attention to um, the world and think through who was telling me that this is the solution and why are they telling me that that's the solution why is that the option and then when i started to look even deeper into the options it looked increasingly like there were not any options on these big major issues foreign policy and the global economy uh, mostly <clears throat> what was being said was extremely um, similar across the two big political parties in the UK at the time, um, the Labour Party and the Conservatives. They were saying, well, we, we need to stay in Afghanistan, we need to stay in Iraq, we need to support the banks. <clears throat> um, and all the both sides were saying this. These supposedly opposing sides were saying exactly the same thing. And that's ultimately what really disconnected me from <clears throat> mainstream politics. And in 2015... I actually ran for parliament as an independent candidate um, at a pretty young age. Um, and that was purely as a political protest. So I wasn't trying to win the election or anything. I didn't really have any campaign funds or anything like that. Um, but I did not want to vote for either of the main parties. And I thought I could present a, a somewhat different way forward for the country during what was a time of... Uh, disaster ultimately on an economic level and then yeah I, I followed really an academic path through all of this stuff um i was a first generation um university student the first in my family to go and do this <clears throat> and to some extent that meant i didn't even know that you could even study this sort of stuff at the academic level i didn't even know that you could study international relations international politics didn't realize this was a thing but I eventually did figure it out and switch over my bachelor's degree entirely to that road, found a lot of success, started to find a few answers to some of the questions that I'd had leading up to this um, point. And then I just went entirely down the academic path. This has worked out. This is making sense. So I did a master's degree back in London. <clears throat> then I came over to the US, 
did a master's degree in New Mexico, and then um, landed a job uh, teaching at an American university. And now I'm about to wrap up my PhD, which is on this military industrial complex stuff. And I'm trying to modernize the military industrial complex with what I'm doing with my uh, research. Quite a quite a journey there running for parliament mm -hmm. that's uh was it just to sort of get political experience and maybe get in that world to try and understand it rather than sort of an inside man sort of thing or just to see what it was like yeah no not really anything like that to be honest uh, someone someone interviewed me and asked me is this uh, an academic exercise it's like <laughs> no not really this this is just me um trying to be the squeaky cog in the machine <laughs> and say there's there might be a problem here maybe there's an alternative way forward that isn't in either of the um um two main parties um but yeah wasn't wasn't trying to win wasn't trying to get any inroads into any of the political parties i was just trying to make a personal point more than anything <laughs> um and i got a few i can't think i got a couple hundred votes so that was more than i was expecting i was expecting about 50 but I'll take that as a minor victory. If I ever did it again, I would be doing it to try and win. So we'll see if that ever happens at one point in the future. <clears throat> well, that's an achievement to even try and do it, to be fair. I'd like to maybe ask a few other stuff on the ac academic side of it at the end. But just for now, what exactly are you lecturing? And is there sort of limits on how far you can go with it in certain topics? Um. So I teach a lot of American government and I teach classes in international relations. Um, in terms of uh, academic freedom, there's a lot of academic freedom in American universities. We would basically have complete freedom to craft the syllabus that we want and to teach the students what we want to teach them. We're expected to cover key topics within the field, right? But we can go outside that. We can focus more on one than, than another. Um, and we can craft a syllabus that we think is useful for our students. So how I approach American government is um, students, I teach them how everything should work in the system. And then I give them an alternative view, um, which comes from C. Wright Mills, uh, the, the very famous political sociologist who wrote The Power Elite in the late 1950s. And he gives the students then an alternative view of American politics and it's how he thinks it actually works so they get a rundown of how it should work and then at least one other perspective on how maybe it actually works in practice which doesn't always really line up with how it should work and then in, in the international relations classes i talk through how we can conceive of the world the different theoretical positions on it and yeah definitely spend some time thinking about critical perspectives and critical ideas um, and we were looking today in one of my classes <clears throat> um, in the um, international relations stuff about the role of money in the world and how money isn't really money anymore. It's kind of just uh, it's backed by nothing. And what sort of consequences does that have? And how does that create a debt based economy and rolling into crises like we just experienced with Corona? Um, what are the sorts of consequences as a result of all that? Um, but yeah, there's a lot of room in um, American academia to explore lots of different ideas. But I have also experienced Amer American academia on the other side of it being taught as opposed to being the teacher. And it's definitely not super open to a lot of um, alternative positions, alternative ideas. And yeah, I was actually just um, talking to a, a professor as well about this earlier. And it's it seems like the discipline of political science in the US is really moving in a direction that doesn't even want to consider critical ideas, <clears throat> which is probably not useful. Yeah, I'm guessing some of those would be about the current conflict, but that's mm -hmm. for later. So tell us, where did the term the military industrial complex come from and who said it? Because many people might think it's maybe the anti-war people who came up with the term mm -hmm. rather than a political leader. Mm -hmm. Yes, this comes from Dwight Eisenhower. Our military organization today bears little relation to that known of any of my predecessors in peacetime, or indeed by the fighting men of World War II or Korea. 
Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. And Eisenhower is uh, definitely, as I think you're alluding to, not an anti-war figure at all. He, he led the Allied forces in Europe during World War II responsible for helping to liberate all of this which we can thank him for ultimately um but um he becomes president and continues to support the war machine because when he was the um the supreme allied commander in europe you could argue that what the war machine was doing was necessary at least to a point there were some things that it did that were certainly not necessary the firebombing of civilian cities for example which the allies absolutely did on multiple occasions in europe and in japan um, but there's a lot of what it did that was definitely useful and required um, and probably um I don't think you'll find anyone arguing against right fighting the Nazis and <laughs> fighting Hitler and freeing Europe from that system of political um, nightmares, which uh, which it had become. <clears throat> so he supports it still throughout his presidency, but by the end of his presidency, starts to take a look around at this system and look and looks at it from a more critical lens, which he can afford to do because he's on the way out, of course, as well. He's he's leaving office. And he comes to the conclusion that what was once a useful war machine is perhaps no longer. Perhaps it's grown into something, and maybe I've been somewhat responsible for that, into something that is beyond control. And he describes it essentially as this entity which has infected the political, economic, military, social and cultural fabric of the entire United States. And ultimately, something that then threatens democracy, because it's a set of institutional interests, which, of course, wants to stick around because you've empowered these people for so long, they don't want to give up that power. Or well, how do they maintain it? Well, by having more and more taxpayer dollars funneled into that machine more and more American lives funneled into that machine. So we're talking blood and treasure, um, the costs here. And um, yeah, he he eventually, he concludes ultimately, and this is all in his farewell speech, which you can find online. And his conclusion to this segment of the speech is that eventually the US may end up being controlled by, he calls it a scientific technocratic elite akin to and largely responsible for the sweeping changes in our industrial military posture, 
has been the technological revolution during recent decades. In this revolution, research has become central. It also becomes more formalized, complex, and costly. A steadily increasing share is conducted for, by, or at the direction of the federal government. Today, the solitary inventor, tinkering in his shop, has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research. Partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by the federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. It is the task of statesmanship to mold, to balance, and to integrate these and other forces, new and old, within the principles of our democratic system. So no longer would decisions be made on a democratic basis, but by this group of so-called experts, um, which to some extent they are, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you want all decisions within society based around what just one group of experts thinks. That's not how democracy is supposed to work. Um, and you see this a lot even, even t today in, in Europe when we get people elected that certain other leaders don't like in other countries. And well... Well, how else are we going to decide our, our leaders, right? And how else are we going to make these decisions? Do we just want to rely on uh, a certain group, a certain elite class to do it for us? Because that's seemingly the direction that we might be heading in if we're not too careful. <clears throat> just going back to Eisenhower quickly, do you think mm -hmm. he does get off a bit lightly in some circles? Because he, that was, of course, his 1961 farewell address. But during his time in office, he was responsible for overseeing the overthrow of Mohammed Mosaddegh in Iran mm -hmm. on behalf of CIA and MI6 mm -hmm. uh, because Mosaddegh obviously nationalized oil and that becomes BP, but that's a whole other thing. Then you have Guatemala in 1954. You have other programs like MK Ultra and Operation Gladio, whether you know, he knew lots of details about that. He obviously must have had an inkling of that sort of stuff was going on no yeah i think you're right yeah because whenever you do hear about eisenhower in these discussions it's almost it's always the the positive side well he yeah. exposed the military industrial complex which yeah is true but like you said was also at the helm of the ship as that entity was growing and evolving and mutating and doing lots of nasty things um it almost comes down to your view of the presidency and the extent to which the presidency has power over all of this stuff and whether or not it would have happened regardless of who was the president. But I think it's probably fair to say he had a, at least for a lot of his presidency, rose-tinted glasses on when he looked at the military because he had seen it do legitimately good things in Europe during World War II. But, um, and he was he was responsible for taking <clears throat> Germans who lived in the towns next to the concentration camps. And he forcibly made them tour the concentration camps. Um, so he had really seen the horrors of war and understood everything that, that came from it. So I think he may have been coming at it from a good place, but yeah, there's also the, like you said, the more critical angle of, well, maybe you should have been um, paying a little closer to attention, maybe thinking a little bit further ahead in terms of the, precedence that some of this stuff would ultimately set still well it's still good at least at least he actually said it which most mm -hmm. presidents wouldn't wouldn't dare do except maybe jimmy carter in the last <laughs> few years he said a few mm -hmm. more interesting stuff but on the discussion of that so do you think post-world war ii 
it the military industrial complex grew naturally or was there archetypes making sure it continued and mm -hmm. doing everything they can or was it just a natural progression of the military just keeping the wheels turning and then it grew and it grew mm -hmm. yeah i think it was definitely the natural progression um side of things and this also helps to argue this point as well because if you come at someone and you try and tell them about the military industrial complex <clears throat> you don't want the first thing that they say to you being oh that's just a conspiracy theory <clears throat> not really if you consider it from the angle that it is a natural development it's far from a conspiracy theory and this is what c Wright mills talks about in the power elite he mentions how during world war ii this group was empowered and they needed to be empowered right again as i've mentioned multiple times if they wanted to win the war well that's all well and good but when you give people that much power they don't just want to give it up um, they want to hold on to it as tightly as possible, and they will do things to go out of their way to ensure that that happens. And one of the um, things that Mills argues is that this ends up being the people at the very tip top of the political, economic and military hierarchies. And what they um, do is they realize after World War II that, hey, we've got more power right now than we've ever had previously in american history how do we maintain that position of power well maybe if instead of economic elites competing with the political elites or political elites competing with the military elites maybe we should all just work together we're all at the tip top of these hierarchies let's just work together to maintain that position and we will rotate around in and out of prominence ultimately and there'll be some disagreements um, but we can have this shared goal of maintaining our political power. And that is what ultimately unifies this group, uh, maintenance um, of its power, of its uh, continued interests in the world. Could you say that's sort of similar how NATO, where before all the European countries are fighting each other and sort of after World War II, they sort of agree to stop doing that and sort of team up align and become an organization where they have shared interests mm -hmm, definitely and nato is um going to be a key element in my um phd that i'm trying to wrap up it's uh it's definitely that on the international level and it's bringing in all these different places which again were the victors so to speak right and they wanted to maintain that position of victory that position of political power and yes, um, then they bring about NATO. Um, and NATO, what it ultimately becomes and evolves into, in my argumentation at least, is this institutional force which essentially brings all these so-called different militaries under the same banner and it morphs and transforms them into a place where they look and sound very similar to one another and they become interoperable to the degree that they're all using the same technologies, the same weapon systems, all this sort of stuff. Um, and then that becomes one massive, almost global military force, um, which of course is really grown into um, after the end of the Cold War as well, interestingly enough. <laughs> Yeah, of course, NATO is a big one, but what other sort of organizations flourished in the Cold War or came out of it? Obviously, Five Eyes and things like mm -hmm. that. Any other ones that sort of flourished during the Cold War? Yeah, I think um, so. Five Eyes, you can trace that actually all the way back to World War II as well, I think, in terms of its origins. It's been called different things over time. And, and yeah, what the that in itself is a collection of English speaking countries right that uh, ultimately come together and they share intelligence with one another about what they think are threats in the world um and how they want to then go about approaching them collectively as a group there are some um theorists that talk about this idea of an anglosphere the english speaking world and that being the center of um global control and domination I'm not as convinced by that, just because the the French in particular have a big role in all of this stuff, especially um, NATO. 
And of course, there's lots of countries that speak lots of other different languages within NATO. And NATO is is really the the transnational military force of our age. Uh, and it does a lot of things and not everyone there speaks English. So I don't think you can really, this cannot, this is not a system that boils down to one race or one people or one language or one gender. Uh, it's far above and beyond all of those little boxes. And to some extent, it doesn't care about those little boxes. It wants the the little people to run around and worry about the the little boxes of race and gender and this sort of stuff while it goes on and maintains its political power no matter what. Yeah, I'd have to agree there. I think probably people mention the English-speaking one because when you look at pretty much every war since World War II or conflict, the British, the Canadians and the Australians have always sort of been there. I mean, obviously the French opposed the Iraq war in 2003, but the British were there, the Australians were there, the Canadians. Obviously, you do have the French come back with Libya and Syria, but it is always sort of the British and Americans, so I guess that's mm -hmm. where it comes from. But I would have to agree there's there's obviously more interests than just English speaking mm -hmm. ones. And one one quick side note on the the French opposition to the Iraq War. So this becomes notorious, so much so in the US that they for a period at least, not any longer, but they're no longer French fries. They are freedom fries. We don't want to, we can't ascribe this beautiful product of the French fry to the French because the French don't want to step up and support the war in Iraq. So they're freedom fries from now on. Well, interestingly enough, after the invasion, the first oil company in the door of Iraq is French. Really? Total. Total. Yeah, that's the first oil company that goes into Iraq post invasion. So, I think we may have lost structure doing because they were the first ones through the door <laughs> sorry you froze a bit there I heard we missed a bit of it but um yeah, so yeah, I was just wrapping up saying they were the first ones through the yeah. door, right? So for all this, all this talk of, uh, yeah, we don't want to support the war. There were at least some elements within the French society, French economy, that were very much in favour of it. How do you reckon they got first in the door? Because I know BP, uh, they got a deal in two thousand nine. I think it was jointly with Petro China, if I'm not wrong. Do you think mm. it was just lobbying, maybe? Yeah, I don't, I don't know the the full ins and outs of that story of how they were the first, um, but just the fact that this happened at all comes back to that point I was making at the start in terms of oil and ulterior motives and having to question why are we really doing things? Are we trying to make Iraq a, a prosperous democracy where its people can go out in the street and protest and cast votes? And All back here, can you hear me? Yep. Hopefully we didn't lose that recording. Uh, no, I think it probably would have just recorded it. Um, maybe it will restart as one file, or maybe you'll have two files yeah, now, but that's, yeah, that's it should fine. be easy. Yeah. Anyway, let's get back onto the topic. So uh, we come out of World War II. Obviously, the military industrial complex is growing. It's becoming more components mm -hmm. over the years. NATO, Five Eyes, and then in the last maybe 20, maybe more years, there's been a rise of private interest. So could mm. you expand on some of those, uh, not quite the tech ones yet, but private contractors like Blackwater mm. and then uh, private corporations, arms corporations mm. and things like that? Yeah, this starts to become massive at the end of the Cold War. Um Some militaries downsizing somewhat, but not a whole lot. Um, but we do get this emerging industry of the private uh, military corporation the pmc as they're often referred to and yeah blackwater is really the one that is the leading the charge on this and it unfortunately leads the charge down some very dark roads um lots and lots of scandals regarding um, blackwater one that i just remember off the top of my head they're driving around iraqi towns just firing at random people this is a, this is not good. Um, the the central problem for anything like this, a PMC, a private military company, is how do you achieve 
legitimacy and accountability with these things. Um, the idea of having the state have a monopoly on violence, meaning that the state has a military and there aren't all these other private forces that have military capabilities, is so the people can hold the state to account. Right? If the state monopolizes violence and the people control the state, well, then the people should control how the state uses its violence. Well, when you open this door into this private corporate realm, the accountability and legitimacy lines become immediately blurred very quickly, so much so that it's almost like looking at static um, on a TV screen. Um, this is um, this is dangerous because when you do open this door and things like this happen, these disasters, these scandals happen, how do you hold those people to account and who is going to hold them to account? Um, is it going to be the country where they're operating? Is that what's going to be holding them to account? Well, what if they're operating in a place like Iraq that doesn't have anything like a, a government to even begin holding them to account? Is the country that put them there going to hold them to account? Probably not, because that opens the door to an admission of guilt and responsibility, which we know companies and corporations, uh, countries and corporations alike do not ever want to do. Um, so yeah, this is a, this is a big thing. And th the problem also is that when you think about where does even a state military get its gear from, where does it get its weapons and tanks and jets? Well, they all come from private corporations. It's not like the government has factories that produces this stuff, um, would probably be somewhat more legitimate and accountable if it did, because then you would not have a force that has a financial interest in the use and continuation of violence, which is exactly what these private military corporations do and the military industry. Could you uh, name the big classic five you hear in America of the biggest military contractors? Yeah, so we're talking... In fact, let me try and... Uh, let me bring up something quickly because... So I have these big five <clears throat> and I'm also trying to expand beyond these as well. I can just, while you're getting that up, the biggest one in Britain and Europe is BAE Systems, which mm. is the one who is selling the equipment to the British government to go to Saudi Arabia for mm. a Yemen pretty much a proxy maybe not the same as the ukraine one but we're doing everything we can to arm them train them we even have uh special forces not doing actual fighting but advising and basically doing everything we can without mm -hmm. having on the ground so we can say oh no don't worry don't worry we're not we're not part of the coalition we're not responsible for airstrikes and bombings that killed but that hit the school bus and killed about 47 and you can hear mm -hmm. uh jeremy hunt he's a British Member of Parliament, uh, basically in a BBC uh, video interview, sorry, saying, yeah, obviously it's horrible that happened, but, you know, don't Saudi Arabia are a great ally and they've been a good ally in the war on terror and they basically just get a free pass. What happened with that bus was, was truly awful and I think it's impossible not to be deeply shocked uh, when, you, when you find out what happened. Britain has a role both in arming the Saudis and with military personnel in place in the command centre from which these attacks are launched. Do we bear some of the responsibility for what happened? The complexity there is our relationship with Saudi Arabia, which is a very, very important uh, military ally to the UK. Um, we are their partners in fighting Islamist extremism and our relationship with Saudi Arabia means that we stop bombs going off on the streets of Britain. <laughs> Compelling evidence is emerging that the actual munition that destroyed the bus and killed all those children was an American Lockheed Martin bomb. Are you going to use your meetings here in Washington to urge the administration to review their entire approach to the war in Yemen, just as you apparently may be willing to do? We are, of course, going to be talking about the Yemen situation uh, with the administration here. 
Um, and I think they have a very similar approach to us. But as, as far as Britain's concerned, when it comes to arms sales, we have one of the strictest regimes in the world. Um, and we constantly review uh, whether the arms agreements that we make when we sell them, uh, whether they are being adhered to. Is the American system as tough as you say the British one is? Will you be, for instance, arguing that perhaps they should return to President Obama's ban on weapon sales? The American administration's approach is a matter for them, um, but uh, both for the United States and for the United Kingdom, uh, you know, we want to make sure that our allies uh, are you know, conducting their activities in a way that uh, we can defend to our own publics, um, but also respecting that they are allies. And so uh, we uh, will have these discussions, but very often they will be uh, frank discussions in private rather than uh, megaphone diplomacy. Us, we go mm -hmm. obviously put even an arms pause on them because mm -hmm. basically ruled in court that it was unlawful because we didn't have an, anything basically in place. Then after a year, basically in a bit, they're like, "Yeah, Liz Truss, the current Prime Minister of the UK, gives it the go ahead, and they go straight back out to Saudi Arabia." Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yemen. That's uh, I haven't focused as much on Yemen as I probably should have, but it's a uh, it's a it's still a conflict that exists, and it exists thanks to the Western world funneling all of these weapons into it. And like you said, BAE systems a key component of that. All of those um, arguments and points they're very similar to what the clothing industry uses. Uh, well, we only just gave the contracts to the factory that burned mm -hmm. down, killed 300 people. It wasn't technically our factory. Uh, we just expected them to live up to yeah. our high standards, and they didn't, right? Who would have Who would have guessed? Um, yeah, very similar logic <clears throat> that, play, that plays out there. But yeah, these big five, so we're talking Lockheed, first of all, responsible for a lot of massive um, military industrial um, achievements and certainly they are achievements uh, Lockheed built the Blackbird the F the SR-71 um, the fastest um, aircraft that's ever been built and still claimed as the fastest aircraft that has ever been built as well also responsible for building a lot of um, fighter jets <clears throat> um, the MH-60 attack helicopter um, lots of um, very important pieces of kit, uh, the Black Hawk helicopter, things that you've seen throughout um, recent history um, that you see in movies and TV shows. All this stuff is really coming from <clears throat> Lockheed Martin, a lot of these most um, most noticeable pieces of kit, the, the silhouettes where you can see and you can tell immediately what it is. Boeing is our second contender here in our top five. And these five kind of rotate depending on the year, who is the biggest. <clears throat> um, Boeing, of course, most people think of it, well, that's how we go on holiday, right? We jump on our Boeing jet and we go across the ocean and we go and sit on a beach. Yeah, you do. But they, they also create fighter jets as well. They've worked very closely with NASA, the American Air Force, the American Navy, Um these rocket powered aircraft is one of the first thing that they were developing back in the 1950s um, for um, the military. They also developed the, the Chinook transport helicopter, which uh, the British use quite extensively. You'd recognize a silhouette of that one, too. And the, uh, the B-52, the massive um, bomber that also comes out of Boeing. Um, so, yeah, these um, technologies that are produced from these companies have been central to how the world has worked on a military level for a very long time. Then the other three of the traditional big five, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman and Raytheon, all doing, again, different things. Occasionally, they work together. Occasionally, they'll share ideas and um, go into joint contracts and stuff. But the, the final point probably worth mentioning on those five is that Current and former American and NATO officials have lots of ties to all these places. And when this stuff is eventually published, I'm writing, you'll be able to see these interesting little charts that I've made that have all these little connections between people and places that raise, again, questions of legitimacy and accountability. Why would the current U.S. Defense Secretary, why would he have been a former executive of Raytheon? Lloyd Austin. Yeah, exactly. Lloyd Austin. Was, is there not a conflict of interest there, perhaps? The <laughs> argument 
in terms of they would say no is well no there's not he's just an expert he's an expert in defense stuff well maybe that is true but there's also you can't just say that and then not consider the other side of it maybe he's got a concerted interest in the business dealings of Raytheon and they were just uh, awarded I tweeted about it a couple of weeks ago I think they were just awarded some massive package of uh, contracts yeah just to touch on that so the top five are all US uh, mm-hmm. military contractors and if you look at the biggest arms dealers in the world not everyone calls it defense contractors go on we're selling arms to Saudi Arabia to bomb they're not mm-hmm. really defending themselves is the US is miles ahead of everyone and then it's Mm -hmm. the uk and then i think it's france or russia then italy but what someone actually pointed out the other day on twitter or a video i watched is the five members of the security council four of them (laughs) are the top arms dealers in the world and then other than russia and maybe china's in the top 10 it's basically all allies so it's israel italy sweden norway all these different Mm -hmm. countries but the uk and the us are the biggest arms dealers in the world. And most people may be surprised that the UK is second and our top recipient is, of course, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states and all the, all the normal crew that clearly show we care so much about democracy that we sell mm. arms to <laughs> family dictatorships like Mohammed bin Salman, <laughs> who even the CIA, CIA obviously admitted that he killed Jamal Khashoggi the Washington mm-hmm. Post uh, journalist. So we clearly don't care about <laughs> democracy. And to say you could ever be humanitarian as an institution, if you're the US or UK, you can't really say that if you're an arms dealer and you're in the business of killing. There may be humanitarian people inside of it, but as an institution, you can't see that. So you've discussed the private contractors and Blackwater. I think he was referring to the massacre in Iraq. And Trump actually uh, pardoned uh, some of them during his presidency. Mm-hmm. It was great. And Eric Prince, who was the head of Blackwater, it's a different name now. I think it's Academy something. Yeah, it's been XC and yeah. then Academy. Yeah, I don't know he, which one it is now. I think actually, it may have been changed again. I think that may be on name number four. <clears throat> yeah. Have you seen uh, where he, I think he wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal saying that they should hand over the whole Afghanistan war. I think it was mm-hmm. 2017 to his private company and run it like the British East India Company Mm -hmm. generally use those words not it's not me trying to say it's uh neo-colonial he he actually referred to the British East India Company which Mm -hmm. is uh just great of him to to just put that out there for us Mm -hmm. yeah just mind-blowing stuff one of the first studies on the problems of all this is actually called goes beyond even arms merchants it's called the merchants of death that's yeah. what these people are. And you can actually find that online, I think. It's uh, it's pretty old. When was that published? Let me see. Uh, 1934. <laughs> um, and it looks at even the, uh, the involvement of these merchants of death, these arms merchants in um, bringing Hitler to power and everything that happened there. But also the the long history that arms merchants have had um, in generating weapons that have ultimately been used to kill thousands and thousands and millions of people ultimately in the end. So we've obviously talked about the big arms corporations, which I'm sure many people should be obviously familiar with some of their names. However, what people might not be aware of is sort of the move today with tech companies and how they're intertwined with the military industrial complex. We obviously had the Snowden leaks with NSA and GTSQ, the British version, working with these different uh, companies like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, all all the normal ones surveilling. And I'm not sure if you've read this book by, um, it's called Surveillance, sorry, Surveillance Valley by Yasha Levine. I think that I think I have that on an Amazon list somewhere. Yeah, and he and I have to bring it to the top. <clears throat> yeah, he he discusses. I mean, he traces all the way back to the internet, which came from ARPA, which is now called mm-hmm. DARPA, which is sort of mm-hmm. the technology arm of the military industrial complex, which I know you're aware of. But can you sort of expand on this and how these tech companies mm-hmm. are military contractors, which tech mm-hmm. companies are, and their and their role in the modern day? 
military industrial system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, that traditional big five and then the others like BAE, the, these are considered the real players in the military industrial complex, but it does now have to be expanded. And this, again, is what my PhD research is trying to do. I'm expanding it into Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and SpaceX. Um, we could go further than that, but um, as my advisor keeps trying to tell me, it's a PhD and you do have to finish it. Um, so I'm going to stick with those. They're kind of the big players um, behind. They really, I think it's fair to say they are behind the scenes of the military industrial complex because they support the computerized technological structures which are required to run modern militaries this is no longer optional right we can no longer just rely on walkie talkies <clears throat> you need satellites you need servers you need all sorts of advanced tech to actually run a modern military and get it to be able to fight a war effectively um where does all of this come from or well, we can start with microsoft um, and yeah, this is far from a computer software um, company. Um, this is um, an organization that has been intimately involved with the US military for a very long time. Um, its gaming controllers have been photographed from its Xbox consoles. They've been photographed on multiple occasions, <clears throat> being used to fly drones by different Western militaries. Um, whenever they're asked about this, nobody really wants to answer any questions. <clears throat> but behind the scenes, it goes far beyond that. It's really their cloud computing and their artificial intelligence capabilities and divisions that the military really wants to use and get on board with. Um, and there are pages on Microsoft's website that get into all of this stuff and precisely what they have done over the years. Google, another big one, where... Um, it's once had the motto, don't be evil. <laughs> Unfortunately, that has fallen by the wayside, I think. I think it's now reduced to a footnote at the one of the very last pages of their company standards. <clears throat> um, Google, also intensely involved behind the scenes with the provision of artificial intelligence and cloud computing technologies. There were protests at Google at one point by employees refusing to actually um, work on this stuff because they thought it might eventually be used to kill people despite any claims that the pentagon may have to the contrary right well we only want to use this to help move things around in a humanitarian disaster <laughs> or we only want to use this to program a robot dog that will rescue people from the side of a cliff that they have unfortunately fallen down well maybe yeah that's true but um it could also be used to program the robots that don't rescue people but actually kill people and this was the realization of the very smart people that google of course employs as its software engineers um so yeah i think we should take them seriously when they say yeah this could probably be used for really devastating purposes <clears throat> I think Microsoft's had some of those protests as well, actually. <clears throat> Amazon, too. Um, this, again, Amazon Web Services, AWS, some of you may have heard of out there. This, too, is now becoming central to American military contracting, and they are repeatedly bidding for contracts in AI and cloud computing. And also we have Blue Origin, which is maybe worth mentioning um, in side by side with Amazon. Jeff Bezos's personal rocket company also seeking, I believe, um, accepting military contracts um, as well. Um, so yeah, Amazon, Jeff Bezos, absolutely involved with this. <clears throat> the provision of military power which of course ultimately ends up killing people and there's spacex the last one <clears throat> um spacex elon musk they've kind of been at loggerheads with the american government to a certain extent trying to get their foot in the door of this bidding system but have eventually been successful and are now being used extensively by the u.s military to move cargo around the starlink system of course which i think is i don't think it's technically a spacex company i think it's its own thing kind of like blue origin um, and aws but all tied together same people same outcomes unfortunately <clears throat> yeah just to go back microsoft and amazon have 
both been basically clamoring for the same contract. It started off mm-hmm. kind of Microsoft and then it's Amazon and then Microsoft are appealing it. I actually had a look the other day and I still don't think it's resolved. So mm-hmm. they are both clamoring for these uh, the contracts. Mm-hmm. And I think Google Earth was actually bought from the CIA when it was called mm-hmm. Key Inc. or Keyhole, something like that, which obviously the military uses Google Earth for one purpose and Mm. Google used it for another, and I'm pretty sure they used it in the Iraq war because why would they not? That's the thing Mm. about the tech company. They're so intertwined. Like NSA and GTHQ use data for surveillance. Well, these tech companies collect data every day about every single person, and Mm. then there's just so much to it, and then the tech companies have space companies now, and obviously Elon Musk was involved with... I don't know if he just put the internet up for Ukraine or actually militarized it so they could do drone strikes. Do you do you know sort of how far, uh, what sort of side it was on? Yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head, but but all this stuff overall is just it's really interesting to think about, especially because these are the companies that wave the flags highest when it comes to things like uh current political events let's say um certain hot political movements that these companies are very quick to jump on board with um and supposedly espouse that we're these moral ethical companies and we always do the right thing and we're looking out for everyone in society while on the side um they're doing this sort of stuff it's almost like the mafia um if you look at what the mafia does they own all these stores and they their grocery stores and their butcher stores um and you can go in there and you can get um a slice of uh, meat and you can take it home and you can cook it and you can enjoy it for me i think that's the microsoft xbox right i can do that i can do that and i can have an xbox and i can own it and enjoy it and play it What's going on behind the the storefront, right? What's going on out back? And when you look at the mafia, all sorts of things that go on, right? Nefarious deals, corruptions, murder. Sort of similar situation, I think, here. When you look at what these companies do behind the scenes and what they don't really publicly talk too much about. And when they're asked about, they don't want to answer any questions on. Um, yeah, it starts to look like somewhat of a similar situation. Of course, unlike the mafia, all very much legal and above board but is it ethical is it moral that's where the gray area becomes a big question yeah definitely and and the the interesting thing about all of this i'm not sure how aware of it i'm sure you are is the tech companies and the arms companies and we can get to the think tanks and sort of media as well they all have the same shareholders. So if you look at Lockheed mm-hmm. Martin, Apple, Google, and then you even look at the media, so you look at Disney and uh, any other of the big names, Comcast, their top shareholders are BlackRock, Vanguard, JP Morgan, mm-hmm. Morgan Stanley. E- every pretty much big multinational in America have the same shareholders. So tech, military, and media. So when the media are on there, maybe discussing a war that might happen, they have shareholders who are invested in the arms corporations and then the tech companies who like Mark Zuckerberg said to Joe Rogan that the FBI asked them to censor information on Hunter Biden and stuff like that. They're all the same shareholders, all different companies. So it's just intertwined. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm sure also you're aware of think tanks, so all the big ones. And mm-hmm. I know you might want to talk about the Atlantic council, they're all funded by arms corporations, oil, governments, militaries, the whole mm. shebang. And then they obviously write these papers of why we need to be doing more here. And mm-hmm. it's not actually discussed that they're funded by arms corporations who get contracts from the government for this. Yeah, I mean, you kind of just summed it all up. I don't, <laughs> Sorry. I don't, have, I don't know if I have anything to add to that apart from this is not a, this is not a good system. This is another one that explores that. The Carlisle Group. This is another one of those investment firms um, that's worth exploration. But um, Peter Phillips, another academic author. I don't know if you've heard of him, but you should look him up, Peter Phillips. So yeah, there you go. There's the book. That's what I was going to reference, Giants. He talks about all this stuff, right? And where these places are invested. Um, 
and the sort of perhaps influence that that might mean on the the things that they do um yeah it's a it's a system that's so big and so powerful that i'm more and more in a state of realization that i don't actually know what we do about this <laughs> Um, yeah. But that might be a maybe a, a good point to hand off to the viewers and they can leave us comments on uh, how we can go about resolving this structure, what needs to change in the world. <clears throat> yeah, because that's all played into another one of my questions is after all these interventions in the war on terror and you can't, no matter what you say, oh, they had good intentions. They had good mm -hmm. intentions of Afghanistan, Iraq, everywhere mm -hmm. and Libya and then it goes into civil war and cnn reported i think 2017 2018 there's an open slave market and then syria mm -hmm. and then yemen you can't it doesn't matter if they had good intentions if they keep doing it and it ends up like that you'd be like i think think you should back off how is it even mm -hmm. pre war on terror there's the gulf war the sanctions in iraq korea vietnam i would go on forever nicaragua how is it that after all of this people still don't seem to like with the ukraine russia conflict they, they believe mm. it's humanitarian we need to help rather than it's just a continuation of 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 the same military industrial complex mm -hmm. yeah it's a, a sad state of affairs um this is actually one of my planned post phd project projects why do people allow this system and structure to exist why do they allow a military to exist and operate in a way that steals their money and steals their children and does nothing for them at all. Uh, maybe in some cases, some instances, yeah, or we don't want to be too black and white. Yeah, sometimes the military does do good things. Maybe it does protect us in some cases. Maybe there are some crazy people out there that you want to protect yourself from. But there are also these massive high profile incidents where the complete opposite has happened. And again, in the power elites by C. Wright Mills, he writes in there that people are psychically raped into believing a certain view of the military, which maintains this structure, which is essentially a nationalist view. This is our military. This is our thing, right? This looks after us. That's the whole social environment that the military exists within, which shields it to such a degree that it can continue to operate in this way. I mean, to go sort of counter and play devil's advocate of my question, the reason people go along with it, obviously generations change, but there's always a new enemy. So the Cold War, mm -hmm. you have the Reds, the Communists, the Russians, that ends. And somehow within about 10 to 15 years, there's a massive new enemy, which is the war on terror and terrorism. And now we're back to Russia and China. There's always an enemy to justify why we need to do this. It's justifying, you know, all the coups in the Cold War because we can't have a communist government. We have to put democracy on hold to save mm. democracy. And then the war on terror, oh no, we need to do this for that. And then issues like ISIS come out of Iraq after they fired all the Ba'athist uh, officers, mm. got bored, all the... Uh, terrorists who was mixing in the same prisons and then the whole debacle in syria all coming to light and isis growing and we're like maybe we should stop doing these and then it just justifies a new pretext so we need to stay in syria because we're fighting isis they create mm -hmm. their own problems and somehow they're like we're the ones who need to fight it and it's just a constant yeah and what and what just happened where are we even at with this now seven eight months ago Something legitimately terrible happened. <laughs> uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Well, it would be so much easier to get massive support for Ukraine from within the Western world if the Western world had not acted like this for the past 20 years. If it had not gone around the world looking for problems, looking for enemies, perhaps people wouldn't be as concerned about helping out a place like Ukraine when something truly disastrous does happen instead of questioning why are we sending 60 billion dollars to ukraine <laughs> americans would probably say we want to send them 160 billion dollars right because we're here and we're living in this peaceful world that has not been subject to two decades of complete disastrous war and we want to stay in the peaceful world but that's that's not where we've been 
Um, we've been in this place where it's all been controversial, lots of questions, uh, legitimate questions. And yeah, now you have a significant pro- proportion of Western populations that are saying enough is enough. Right? We've supported all these wars for all these decades. We don't want to support this one. Um, doesn't matter how legitimate now this problem is because we have a long history of illegitimate problems. This is a really bad position for the world to be in right now, ultimately, um, because how do you get people back on side to support the military once again um, to go and fight legitimate enemies um, when they have not been doing that for a very long time? Yeah, it's extremely hard to take them serious when Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're... So obviously Joe Biden signed... Sorry, it went through the Senate that they was going to give Ukraine a 40 billion aid package. And the same day, you can see it in the Hill, that they rejected a 48 billion dollar package to local businesses and stuff that obviously basically lost their business due to government mm-hmm. policies in lockdown. And then say, well, so you're saying they care more about Ukrainians themselves. Mm-hmm. And I saw you recently did a video, or not recently, about Afghanistan and all the other problems like homelessness and everything else going on America, but somehow mm-hmm. they just have this infinite money for Afghanistan. Apparently a country that has $887 billion in credit card debt, $195 billion in medical debt, $1.6 trillion in student loan debt, 30 million people without health insurance, 500,000 people homeless on the streets, 40,000 of which are veterans of its military forces, can afford to leave behind $7 billion worth of weapons in Afghanistan after the catastrophic withdrawal that happened there recently. And this country, of course, is the United States of America. Yeah, just think how different the world would be if the war on terror didn't happen. Just think how all of that money could have been used to grow and improve Western societies, and instead it went completely down the drain. Um, This is why people get angry when money is being funneled to a place like Ukraine. When something legitimately devastating happens, of course they're going to start raising the question, well, you told us it was devastating before. You told us there were WMDs in Iraq. You told us they could launch missiles on London in 45 minutes. (laughs) Well, they've made their own mess here, (laughs) unfortunately. Yeah, and you can clearly see, obviously, where, especially the US, and I'd say the UK too, but especially the US, their priorities of, they have a $780 billion budget for Mm. military. They run around 800 military bases around the world, Mm -hmm. and there's no way you'd be spending that amount of money if you was there, you know, just trying to be the policeman, and humanitarian, Mm -hmm. us. In any other century, that is a vast mm-hmm. empire, which is a word. Yeah, and and who power. who asked the American government to do this? Was there a massive portion of the American people that were protesting on street corners saying we want a transnational military empire? Not really. And there's there's generally never really been that in the US, actually. So then that brings us all the way back to, well, who is actually pulling the strings? uh probably not who the tv is telling us (laughs) yeah so you've given us a lot of time so i sort of want to close up on that unless there's anything else you want to add on that just before my last sort of closing questions no go go for it hit me with the last couple of questions yeah Uh, i was just going to ask what sort of book you recommend so we can start with maybe the, the tech side of it, if you have any of that, or do you get most mm-hmm. of your information, articles, or just reading, you know, news of contracts and stuff like that with, with tech and the military mm-hmm. national security side of it? Yeah, so I think everyone's starting point has to be C. Wright Mills, the power elite. So you got to mm-hmm. start there. That's going to give you the theoretical and historical basis to understand this whole structure of elites. Um, It's a very easy text to get because it's a very um, important text in political science and sociology. It's pretty cheap as well. 
Um, so definitely start there. And then in terms of shifting into the tech side of things, let me see. So I I mainly have used books. I prefer books to articles because they can flesh things out in a bit more detail. Um, one good one on AI and all of this stuff is Army of None by Shah, S-C-H-A-R-R-E. I forget his first name. Um, a classic one on nuclear war, Arms and Influence by Thomas Schelling. A uh, really important text. <clears throat> and another, I know the author, I don't remember the name of the book, The Future of War by Lawrence Friedman. That's a really good look at all the ultra high-tech developments as well. In terms of the uh, Microsoft, Samsung's, Google's, this sort of thing, uh, maybe I'll be able to help you out when I eventually get this book published in a year or so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's not going to be too many books about it because it's so mm. recent. I mean, the only one I know currently is the the one I said before. <laughs> um, do you have any book recommendations on just the development of the military industrial complex out of World War Two? So, sort of the origins of it. Uh, I, again, I definitely the power elite that's going to help a lot. And in terms of others, let me see here. I've got a list of uh, what would be a good one. The ultimately, with the military industrial complex, there are some books exclusively aligned with this way of thinking there are others that are uh you kind of have one or two chapters that are yeah about. i mean there's a lot of books that are specifically about certain wars certain coups like i've got that i'm not sure if you've read killing hope by william blue i've got that somewhere around here i have not yet read it i've got it somewhere yeah, i recommend that um, unfortunately just died a few years ago but that goes through every hmm. intervention from world war Two till just after the gulf war because that's when it was written uh mm. it's a really good book i re recommend that yeah it sounds like you're on um another one maybe the american deep state by peter dale scott and all of peter dale scott's books would actually highly recommend they're all along these sorts of lines <clears throat> and thinking but, critically about the true purpose of american foreign policy what is it really trying to do just to actually a quick question, sorry, to keep you on the academic side of it, I thought of earlier, how would they feel if you went into Peter Dale Scott's work that obviously talks about the CIA and the military mm. being involved in drug smuggling? And also, mm. if you know, if you went too hard on Israel, would that be a step mm. too far? Um, I don't think so. Not really, not really for me. Um, yeah, I don't foresee that really being a problem. Um, and Peter Dale Scott's work is published with academic publishers so right i can put that on a syllabus anytime i want <laughs> very easy to defend <clears throat> that's good covered his base as well mm -hmm. all right well thanks for doing the interview i really appreciate it hopefully we covered uh all the necessary topics probably only mm -hmm. missed a few like the bilderberg group and other things like that uh but that could be a topic for another time so mm. thanks for coming on uh just let people know where they can find you i'll put everything in the show notes as much as i can mm. of what we discussed and the and the books but where can people find you yeah youtube twitter facebook stuart j hooper one word uh middle initial in there and then yeah you'll find me and i'm covering current events and on youtube i'm trying to keep up as close as possible with the conflict in Ukraine and desperately hoping that I'm not going to wake up to a headline that says there's been a very large bang somewhere. Um, I think we can avoid it, but we seemingly keep edging closer towards it as well. <clears throat> but So that's my focus on social media and YouTube right now. And yeah, I would love uh, any support there. That would be awesome. Yeah, there's definitely slow escalations that's happening mm -hmm. in, the, in the Ukraine war. Hopefully it doesn't go too far i have faith that i don't think even the political leaders of both countries really are stupid mm -hmm. enough to to go to nuclear war i don't know how much of it is public statements of you know trying to sort of scare them off rather than actual intentions to to nuke, mm -hmm. nuke the world which i think would be stupid on their behalf but mm -hmm. you know, hopefully not yeah we can we'll live in hope <laughs> anyway 
thanks for coming on. Thanks for all your time and uh, good luck with uh, your future work. And I'll keep up to date on your videos coming out about Ukraine. Thanks a lot, Louis. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you.